Hello and welcome. Today we are joined by Dominic Tristram, a member of the Green Party. The Green Party was founded in 1985 and now has around 55,000 members. Hello Dom and welcome to the Bath Studio School. Could you please tell me a bit about yourself and growing up? Right, well, um, as you said in your introduction, my name is Dominic Tristram. I have been uh, in the Green Party since about 2005. Um, I have lived in Bath since the year 2000. I moved straight here from university. Um, I've always been interested in politics, uh, but it starts off with just an interest in the environment. Um, I grew up in a place called Newbury, where um, when I was a teenager, they were building a big bypass, which was very controversial because they were bulldozing a whole load of old trees and things. They had a choice of two routes. One took it through some pretty boring industrial estates, and another route took it through some areas of outstanding natural beauty and stuff, and they chose to build it through the countryside. So it upset a lot of people. And that got me in interested in sort of issues to do with the environment. Um, and I, I avoided politics for a long time. Um, but then when I went to university, I got more politicised and I realised actually you couldn't really change anything unless you engaged the political system. Um, so I joined initially the Liberal Democrats um, because when I moved to Bath, they were the party that wasn't the Tories. Um, but then I realised actually that was a big compromise because the Lib Dems did lots of things I didn't really agree with, like they were very pro-privatisation and everything like that. So I thought actually, if you're going to be active politically, you should be in a party that you really agree with. And that's why I'm in the Green Party. And in 2015, I stood in the general election um, in Bath, and we did pretty well. Um, got about the same vote as Labour, um, surprised everyone, I think. So um, I'm now in the candidate again for a new snap general election. Amazing. And uh, when you were younger, were you, when did you become aware of the Green Party? Um, I guess I was always aware of it. And my, my parents um, are very true blue Conservatives mm. and still are. Um, so I don't agree with them at all on, on politics. But when, I think when you're young, you don't... Well, I certainly didn't really question my parents' politics. I, you, 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 I wasn't really that interested in it, I have to admit. I was more interested in causes. I've always been into recycling and the environment and, and nature. And it's only later when I realised that actually you can change what the government does and your, and your council if you just become involved in politics. And certainly, um, at a local level, Elect, uh, councillors can be elected with a very small swing in votes. So I thought, actually, there's stuff that anyone can do. And so that's when I became... I, I've always been aware of the Green Party, but I became more aware when I looked at all the parties to consider which one to join. Okay. And when you're uh, not busy with the Green Party, like in your free time and stuff, what do you like to get up to? Oh, well, I have two small children, so <laughs> they take up a lot of my time. Uh, I work in computers, so um, I do freelance work. Um, I've worked in Bath in computers, I say, for 18 years. Um, and now I work mostly from home uh, in, my, in the spare time I have. Okay. So we found out that the Green Party has been established as England's fourth largest party after local elections and has now won nine seats from the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. Um, so I must ask what it's like being part of the Green Party and knowing that it is as big as it is. Um, well, it's quite exciting. I mean, in 2015, which is the last general election I stood in, and last election, in fact, uh, at that point, we were larger than the Liberal Democrats in members. Um, it, was a, it was a strange time in politics when people were disillusioned with absolutely everything, <laughs> pretty much, and we saw a huge surge in our membership. And we've retained a lot of those members, but obviously the Lib Dems have gained more since. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's... It's an exciting time to be in the party. What's not generally discussed about the last local elections we had what, a week ago um, is actually the Green Party got the largest increase in percentage of councillors. We've got more councillors than ever before. And you look at the news, you wouldn't really think that. It was all about whether the Labour or the Tories did better. Mm -hmm. But actually the Green Party as a percentage did best. We've, uh, so people don't really talk about it, but we're quite pleased with the results. And what changes um, would you like to make to Bath, for particularly concerning young people? Well, I mean, young people have got so many, have much more investment in everything. I mean, there's yeah. not just the, the things now like schools uh, and, you know, the immediate facilities for young people, but ev absolutely everything about our future is so much more important for young people. For example, um, Brexit. You know, I, 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 I despair uh, that the, the, what's been taken away from the young, which I had when I was younger, and all of, all of you here currently, because we're still in the EU, can have free university in, in mainland Europe. That's being taken away by generally older people who don't want you to have that. Um, and then there's the things that are more immediately obvious, like the closure of uh, children's centres, which are very young people. Um, youth services are all being closed with cuts. And this is all down to, not because we don't have the money, but because of an ideological austerity that 
it's all about cutting taxes and closing services. Um, we don't need to do it, but there's been so much, I mean, that's just been what the main parties have been talking about for so long that people almost don't question it. So I would like to see far more money put in um, youth services, um, giving young people something to do, and also education. I mean, it, it's crazy now that a lot of people, children are coming to school hungry. You know, sometimes they haven't eaten a hot meal for, for weeks, and that's outrageous. So that's all to do with local services and education, working together to make sure that nobody's left behind. Because you can't really educate, you can't really learn much when you're hungry. Yeah. Um, so recently uh, in the news there's been a lot of stuff about voting and the voting age. What are your views on voting age being lowered to 16? Well, the Green Party's long campaigned for votes of 16, big fans of it. I think, well, certainly we think um, that if you are old enough to get married and join the army and all those other things, then of course you should be able to vote because you have a real say, or you should have a real say in your future. Um, you pay taxes at 16, so why shouldn't you vote on how those taxes are spent? Um, it's absolutely unequivocal. We think all 16-year-olds should vote. In fact, we go further than any other party. We think actually everyone should vote. Uh, most parties say prisoners shouldn't. I mean, why shouldn't prisoners have the vote? They're still citizens. And if you want to rehabil re rehabilitate people, then you've got to be invested in the system. Okay. And um, what do you think are some of the big challenges for young people, particularly in Bath? Well, as I say, I mean, Bath is a really interesting place because even though it's a in theory a wealthy city because there are lots of wealthy people in it actually the um, average income is quite low um, so actually there's quite big pockets of, of poverty and I think poverty is such a, a real um, stranglehold on what actually the, the, the facilities that, you, that are available for young people I mean if the city doesn't have the money to spend on them then actually they suffer obviously um, I think in Bath in particular it's a compact city, so there's not a lot of space. Uh, if you live in a, a sort of an area without any much green space, it's difficult to get into sports. I mean, there are sports facilities, but actually there's not many compared to other cities. Um, there's the lack of access to education. I mean, the schools are good, but people have to travel all the way across the city mm. to get to their schools sometimes. Because, I mean, here we've had the clo closure or the imminent closure of Culver Hay or Bath Community Academy, so you'll get children from odd down, not having to travel all the way across the city, which is crazy. Um, but it's not just schools, is it? It's about things you can do outside school. Um, I think it, there should be much more provision of um, so things like the community college. You should be able to have part-time courses in, in um, Bath College, much more easily available for everyone. So if your school doesn't offer something you want to do, I mean, this school is a great example of offering stuff that's very, you know, mm. you've got um, photography and art and all that sort of stuff. But some schools, because of the pressure from the government to be sort of, open quotes, academic, um, some schools don't even offer anything like that. Uh, so why should a child who has true no choice of their own has to go to a school that doesn't offer those things? Why can't they do that? Why can't they, you know, follow their dreams and become a photographer or something? So I think it's not practical for every school to offer that, but offer everyone the opportunity to go to the college in the evening if they want to or weekends and do those courses for free. It should all be part of the education because an education isn't just about passing exams. It's about seeing what you're good at and you don't know what you're good at unless you can try everything. As you may be aware, at our school we have a deprivation index of 52%, which means that a lot of our students are classes living in, uh, living in very close to poverty. Um, so what are your plans to address this? Well, I mean, there's a big difference here between local politics and national politics. There's, yeah. there's only so much you can do locally. The council doesn't have a lot of power, really, to, to uh, eliminate poverty. It can decide how it spends its money. And one thing it could do is increase taxes on people who can afford to pay more and give, those, give that money to people who don't have, don't have the resources. But that aside, there's so much more we could do redistribution of wealth. We're the sixth richest country in the world. It's outrageous that people have to go to food banks. It's outrageous that children turn up at school hungry. I mean, it's outrageous that people can't do what they want because they're in sort of jobs that pay them barely enough to live, um, and they're just working all the time. So people have, having two jobs, and kids growing up in that sort of circumstances, those circumstances, what, what chances do they have compared to the kids who grew up in very comfortable circumstances? Um, I would like to see huge amounts of money invested in people, not just things, but people. So at the moment, we subsidise companies. We should be subsidising people. To do, you know, to free up, to limp, so all this potential that people have that's never realised because they don't have a chance to do it. They're struggling to survive. I mean, you say, yes, poverty, the levels of poverty are obviously very important when you're younger, but we see that all the way through the system. 
So how you do in life is actually dictated by how wealthy your parents are. Mm. Not how hard you work, although obviously you do need to work hard, but it's how, your, how rich your parents are completely determines how you live your life until, certainly until your parents die, which is, you know, might be when you're 60 or 70. That's not fair. Well, how you do, sh everyone should have the same chance, and the people who don't have the same chance should be helped by the state. So there's things that you can do that are very obvious but controversial with most other parties, like inheritance. You know, uh, conservatives in particular get very excited about inheritance tax. Um, I think there should be no inheritance tax. That sounds very, very right wing, but what I mean is all the money you, should inherit, you inherit should be just liable to income tax. So instead of all this money staying in families forever, it all just gets redistributed. Because when those people are dead, they don't need the money. Their children inherit some. They'll inherit a, quite a lot, probably, but they'll pay tax on it. Why shouldn't they? Mm. Why is it this, the case now that you can inherit a million pounds and pay no tax? That's absolutely mad. Because those people will stay rich, and then the people who need some of that, those resources will stay poor. Because even if you work all the day, you know, as hard as you can, there's people who do that, and they still earn barely enough to live on. And that's not right. Everyone who works full-time should earn enough to live on and provide for their families. And once you sort of sort that out, actually a lot of the other issues around poverty kind of sort themselves out as well, yeah. because if everyone has enough money to live, then people don't live at that sort of level of poverty. It all sort of, the money does filter down, much more so than just saying, oh, well, let's, you know, unemployment's low. Well, unemployment being low doesn't make any difference if people aren't earning enough to live on. Okay. Um, you've already answered this question, so I'll ask you uh, another. Why do you think um, the country is in th this position with such a... Um, we have, in this country, some very fundamental issues. We have a broken electoral system. First past the post just means that the big two parties pass power between themselves every few years and nothing changes, mm. really nothing changes. And for all the talk of Labour saying, oh, it's a radical new kind of politics, they still oppose proportional representation. Mm. You know, they still vote tribally. So as an example, um, they like to talk about the NHS. And I'm not picking on Labour particularly here, because the Tories do it as well. Uh, but um, Caroline Lucas, our, one of our co-leaders, uh, had a NHS reinstatement bill in, in uh, the Commons a few months ago, which was basically to end privatisation in the NHS. Labour abstained. They didn't vote for it because it wasn't a Labour bill. You know, we, we have to kill that sort of stupid mm. tribalism because nothing will change. As Labour, it suits Labour to inherit power every few years, and it suits the Tories to inherit it back. And so between them, they don't change anything. Mm. What we really need is a radical change. So we need to fix our, our broken political system. But we also really need to radically rethink how we run the country. Um, we, we support something called the universal basic income, where everyone gets enough money to live on, regardless of what they do. Because at the moment, people are forced into these low-paid jobs, sometimes taking hours to get there from where they live. They haven't got time to look after their kids. Or sometimes they're carers. They haven't got time to look after ill family members. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous that these people, the NHS then has to pay to do that when actually the family would be better off doing it. So there's this whole system rigged around work and making money for big corporations. Your life is not about work. Your life is about living. Mm. Um, you know, when people say to you, and it bothers me in education as well, oh, this is good because this is relevant to work. And oh, we've we brought in this company to tell people how to, you know, learn this thing. Um, no, that's not what it should be like. Your education should be about learning for its own sake. And it really bothers me when you see companies coming in, and all schools are guilty of this, and they're forced to by the government. They're forced to take money from companies. And the companies will come in and say, instead of just teaching you, let's say computing, because I work in computers, I was, I've been a programmer my whole life. And they'll say, oh, it's great, because uh, Microsoft, I'm picking them, but lots of people do it, have come in and they've given us all this stuff, and they've told us how to do this. And actually, all Microsoft are doing is training you up to work with Microsoft. That's not what education is. It's not about, um, it's not about training, it's about learning. And that carries on through universities. So you see this, um, you know, the government saying, oh, well, this university course is pointless because it's not teaching people for a real job. It doesn't matter. The university isn't about jobs. The university is about learning about something. Um, so there's a whole, so there's a whole loads of ways we, other ways we could change yeah. the system. But yeah, I mean, there's, politicians are liars, almost all of them. And, I, and, you know, it's really sad. People are cynical. Um, one thing that we could change for the best, I think, is apathy could end. Apathet uh, people being apathetic is just toxic for this country. Mm. You should always vote. And if you feel strongly about something, you should always do something about it. Go to a protest, join a political party, speak up about it, because if you don't do anything about it, nothing will change. And that suits the people who are in charge at the moment. In recent years, the Bath Council has, invi in, in recent years, the Bath Council has invested money into affordable housing estates to give young people the opportunity to get onto the property ladder. 
However, um, many have complained that the affordable housing is well above the national average. For instance, the, there's a spring, the Spring Wharf housing estate, which dubs itself as having affordable homes, and also 300 homes planned for construction at the top of Oddam on Greenbelt land, of all things. My question is, um, what would the Green Party do to solve some of these issues? Or what could... Um, well, I mean, firstly, I, I, I really take issue, and this isn't your definition, of affordable housing, because yeah. a lot of this affordable housing isn't affordable. I mean, exactly. it, it's, it's just some percentage less than the market rate. But mm. I mean, you know what it's like. If, if you earned the national average salary of just under £25,000, I think, there's no way you could afford a house now. Mm. You might just about to be able to afford it if you shared with somebody else. You don't want to have to buy a house with somebody else just to afford one. I mean, that's not the best basis for a relationship. I mean, it's crazy. So there's a few things we've got to look at. We've got to have genuinely affordable houses. Uh, we've got to have a, a huge program of uh, building council housing, which is affordable rents, mm. not to buy. We've got to end uh, uh, right to buy, because what we had is lots of people buying their council house for a huge, huge discount, mm. taking it out of the pool of council housing, and then no more built. So actually the social housing stock goes right down. Um, we've got to also, and Britain has this very weird obsession with owning a house. Um, it's not absolutely necessary to own a house, and it's good that people can. Uh, I think we have to take the stigma away from renting, and we have to make renting much more attractive, as in properly controlled landlords, so that rented houses are much nicer, mm. and um, make sure that we control those rents. No, I don't think anyone should be in a position of, and then there are people in Bath who do this, all they do is own houses, they don't work, and then you just make tons of money, because mm. you know, they can charge what they want because there's a shortage of housing. That's not right. Um, the council should be renting those houses out, really. I mean, I'm not against people renting a house or two to make some additional income, but I am not sure that's a good way for anyone to make all of their income, because obviously they're charging way more in rent than they have to pay out, so the person renting is effectively being ripped off, mm. and it's taking that house out of, the, um, out of the market. Now, what would the Green Party do? In 2015, we, we were talking about building millions of houses by 2020, and, and the press ridiculed it. So, oh, how can you do that? Of course you can do it. It's just because nobody's talked about it for so long. Mm. Um, Labour are now starting to talk about it a bit, and they're getting ridiculed for it. We can do anything we like. I mean, the thing is, when you run the government, you've got to change the narrative. What I, what I would do is just in, employ a sort of national sort of house building core and get rid of the private sector guys. If they won't do it, just do it. Just the government yeah. can directly employ a load of people to build houses and just build the houses. We, in this country, are so uh, sort of scared of rocking the boat and doing something different. And other countries, to their credit, will just go, well, we need some houses, we'll just build them. And um, I'm in no way a fan of China <laughs> and the way China ru is run. But in some ways, having a command economy like that, they say, well, we need this, we'll just do this. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to sort of go cap in hand to these big firms of um, building companies and say, oh, please, please, please build this and don't rip people off. We'll just say, no, we're just going to build it as the state. And because we okay. need it. And if the private companies don't like it, well, bad luck. They should have done it better. Yeah. Do you think that by the time people around my sort of age, like 15, 16, and maybe a little bit older, by the time like we're all finishing schools and thinking about moving out, things would have changed to make it easier for young people to get onto the property ladder by then? Uh, no, because actually none of the big parties are actually talking about anything that will make it any better. Um, I think it will get worse. I think this country... Again, I, I don't keep mean to keep having a go at Labour, but what, what bothers me is that they, a lot of young people seem to pin their hopes to them. Labour are not ch talking about changing this fundamentally, and, and because they are fans of hard Brexit, that's going to cost this country billions, and any, any sort of social programmes they might be thinking about it are going to be dwarfed by that huge debt we're going to have to pay. Now, we may, uh, may not have hard Brexit. I don't know if you saw that in the Lords yesterday, there was a, um, a, an amendment passed that would, would keep us in the single market. The Brexit, much as it is a boring, kind of politically nerdy thing, mm. is so massively important to everything. Because if we leave the EU, the young are going to be the worst hit by everything. There'll be no money to spend on any housing. You know, all that money is going to be spent propping up all our companies, which are going to start falling over. So it's really important to, that that doesn't happen. But also, it, none of the big parties talk about radical, the radical change we need. You know, don't get me wrong, Labour, I, I think, are better than the Tories. And they say a lot of the right things. So if it's a choice between them, I would rather there was a Labour government. You know, I'm not saying I, that's not true. But they're not talking about anything radical. Nothing will change that much. Things will get a bit better, but they're not going to suddenly magic up a load of houses for younger people to live in. Um, the best thing you can do, I think, 
the best thing that would free up housing stock is an immediate massive increase in inheritance tax, uh, a big increase on taxes on second homes. I mean, I would like to see anyone owning a second home paying substantially more council mm. tax on it, um, and big increases on the rent that landlords get. And that would just free up loads of housing. Um, I mean, the ridiculous thing is actually um, bedrooms per person in this house. That, that number is very high because there's lots of, it has, to be said, it has to be said, mostly older people living in huge houses on their own. Mm. You know, that's crazy. We, so we've got families in tiny houses and wealthy older people in huge houses. Now, I'm not saying we should take those houses from them because they're their house, but we should make it a financially worthwhile thing for them to do to sort of sell that and buy somewhere smaller so that their families can move into it. Just with the housing stock we have, I and mean, there's a million empty homes in this country. Mm -hmm. And people talk about building more, but why, why have we got these empty ones? Because people buy a house as an investment. They don't want tenants in it because just the house value goes up on its own. That's crazy. You know, it does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I gather that you support uh, Jeremy Corbyn's de decision to reduce university fees. Um, well, we've, uh, long before Labour talked about that, we've supported scrapping university fees yeah. for a long time. Uh, not in that, but we would write off the debt that students have. Um, it's crazy that people are put off university by debt. And you'll have people argue, say, oh, it's not really debt. It's like a sort of loan which you don't have to pay because uh, blah, 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 uh, rubbish. I mean, it's a debt because it hangs over you. And if, even if you never have to pay it back, you're still thinking, oh, I owe £60,000, £90,000. That's no way to live. I mean, I, I was lucky because I went to university for free. Um, I did a degree and a PhD for free. It didn't cost me. I mean, I, I got money. I mean, the, the government gave me a grant. You know, it's not that long ago. But that's not at the time. That was what happened. It's, that's not a radical thing. Mm. That's perfectly possible. And even today, in Germany, gives grants as free and has free education. So, what Corbyn is saying isn't radical. It's not radical enough because we th we say, you know, why are people burdened by all this debt? Let's just get rid of it. It's perfectly possible. It's perfectly doable. Invest in your young people and stop running universities like businesses. You know, they're a yeah. place of learning. What advice would you give to young people applying to university that are particularly worried about the uh, fees and that of it? Um, well, while we're still in the EU, I'd say seriously consider applying for European universities. You can still get a education taught in English for free in mainland Europe for now. Okay. Uh, do that while you can, <laughs> because we might be in the EU for a while. Uh, if that's taken away from you, um, I would still say go to university. I think it's completely unsustainable, this level of debt. I think at some point it will be written off just by necessity. But when you do go to university, make a big fuss about it, get politically active, and do, don't just think, oh, well, that's just the way it is. Because it's, it's depressing how quickly it's changed. When I ran in the 2015 general election, a lot, some students said to me, well, I don't mind paying a fee because I'm getting something for it. That, you know, just that m mindset, I think, well, School is free, so you're saying actually maybe you should pay for school because mm. you get something for it. I mean, it's just a, it's the same thing. It's still education. There's nothing magic about university. It's just an extension of for people who want to do it, carrying on in education. It should be free as well, and you will pay for it in a way because if you get a job that you're paying more taxes in, you'll pay it back for your whole life. So you know it's perfectly sustainable. Okay. And uh, how are you? How are the Green Party challenging the government in relation to improving mental health services? Well, of course, there's only so much we can do with one yeah. MP. Um, again, because of our broken political system, if we had a, a fair voting system, we'd have about 25, 30 MPs. Um, but when you've got one, it's pretty tricky. Uh, but we do challenge them. I mean, Karen Lucas, Caroline Lucas wins many awards for being best parliamentarian. For you know, she raises lots of questions. Um, mental health services, I mean, we want to massively increase all spending on health care. Um, I mean, our NHS reforms are the most wide-ranging of any party. We want to you know, completely end privatisation and massively increase funding. Um, and, of course, mental health is, has been traditionally underfunded in this country uh, and has been for a long time, which is why we now, now have this crisis. And it doesn't help when some of those services are privatised off, so, you know, Virgin or whoever yeah. uh, will run them for a profit. That's never going to be the best thing for the patient. What you want is money spent depending on who needs it, not who makes you the most money. That's just fundamentally a broken system. Um, but of course, it's not just the NHS and, and social care. It's getting people trained, like in schools, having teachers trained in, in caring for people with mental health issues. Uh, I, I think um, a huge number of people go through uh, some sort of mental health crisis, whether it's you know, depression or some sort of anxiety or grief or anything like that. These can be mental health issues. And to have 
at least one person trained in every school or everywhere where young people are, certainly young people, because young people are, are massively affected by mental health issues more than any other group, just to have somebody to talk to who, has under, who understands your issues and can refer you to somebody who can help you is massively important. So it's not just increasing the funding for the traditional services, it's actually training up a whole load more people who interact with young people and vulnerable people on a day-to-day -day basis. But of course what we're seeing now is services of vulnerable people are closing, which yeah. is like the opposite of what we need. Okay. And uh, what big changes would you like to make to Bath on a whole? Yeah. If you could. Um, I think in Bath we have a huge issue with air quality. Um, the air we breathe is a massively underrated risk and it kills thousands and thousands of people every year um, and it's because of this obsession we have with cars and I, th I think it's slightly crazy that I mean it's a bit different with secondary schools but primary schools for example people don't always go to the closest one so you get people and I live next to a primary school I live next to St Philip's school just down the road and uh, the number of people who turn up in their car every morning park all over the place and let their kid out and you think well, where is that kid coming from probably just half a mile away or less just that mindset of, oh, well, everyone gets driven to school. Just, I mean, you know what the traffic, how much better the traffic is during school holidays. That's crazy. So just little things we can do. So the council could just say, right, no parking zones outside schools. Unless you've got some, you know, disability or something. Uh, yeah. There's got to be a, another, <laughs> another way of doing it. But just little steps. So we, we favour things like uh, a thing called a walking bus, where groups of children are led by adults so you don't even need the parents there, and they're, you know, they're, they're safe because they're led in the line around all the, well, all the houses for all the children and then to the school. All completely safely done. No cars required. And where it's not possible, because the rural areas, because North East Somerset, there's some fairly rural areas, then you can have a school bus service. You know, it's crazy that people drive. And it's, it's expensive for parents as well. Yeah. You know, and parents, it's not even, even that convenient sometimes. They've got to get to work. They don't have to drive their child to school. So, you know, bus picks them up in the morning, brings them back at night massively convenient or even better somebody picks them up and walks to school with them and get people cycling again cycling is massively important i mean i, I don't know does your school have bike racks yeah yeah so i mean i'm not picking on your school because i mean it, you know it's not the school's choice a lot of the time but every school should have bike racks and there should be some incentive to use your bike to get to school but of course the disincentive here is the mad traffic i mean i don't, my, my son goes to bot there which is just in the same grounds as your, your school and um, I know the, track, the car park here in the morning is just insane. Um, so yeah, you might want to die on the road on your bike, but we have to change the roads so people aren't scared about cycling. You know, and that solves all sorts of issues. People are fitter. You know, people get maybe they get into cycling. Maybe they realise they're really good at cycling, and they, that's you know a sport they can they can um, they can do. So there's all sorts of things that council can do, which aren't huge changes. It's just nudging people in the right direction. But mostly, it's getting cars off the road. How do you think Brexit is going to affect, uh, affect Bath in general? Uh, really massively. Um, it's no coincidence that Bath voted quite overwhelmingly to stay in the EU. Um, it's any place that has a lot of um, public sector employees is going to suffer from, from Brexit. Um, any place that depends on international trade. I mean, Bath obviously has a lot of international visitors. The tourist trade is important. Um, if they have to start paying to come here with a visa or something, that's going to put some people off. I mean, I don't know how many. It's already, I mean, the short term, it, people go, oh, it's great because the exchange rate's much better for tourists now. It's so, so much cheaper for them. Oh, yeah, well, great. I mean, that's not going to last forever. They'll, at some point, everything will adjust and then it will become a bit of a pain for them if they have to sit in customs to get here. Um, so the tourism is going to take a hit. Uh, businesses are going to take a hit. Anyone who tr trades with Europe, I mean, in my working life, I haven't worked for an exporter as such, but I've worked for companies, IT companies that do work with the European you know, sort of agencies and companies and governments, if, you, if your work starts getting taxed, you know, some sort of duty or, or tax to pay, then for, uh, European companies are, are going to go, well, we're not going to get these guys from the UK to do the work because we'll have to pay some extra tax on it. We'll just go to somewhere else. And it's, of course it's going to affect us. So Bath, with its tourism and quite high, large numbers of um, IT workers and stuff, is going to be massively hit. And of course, if those guys are hit, um, or move away, or, or just go out of business, then all the people who, whose services they use are going to take a hit as well. You know, because who's going to sell all the expensive lattes to the IT nerds? You know, the, the IT nerds are gonna, aren't going to be there anymore. So um, it's just filtered through all the way down. And uh, Bath is particularly vulnerable to, to Brexit yeah. because of all, all those issues. 
Okay. I'm sure you agree that the homeless epidemic in Bath is awful, and I understand it is very difficult to have the necessary funding to solve it, or at least to improve the issue. However, um, what do you think is the best course of action? Well, again, I mean, in, in a fancy world where the green controlled yeah. government, um, with a universal basis, basic income, nobody would be homeless, because sure. they would just be given the money they'd need to, to get housing. Problem solved. Uh, if they want to. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very wary about saying everyone should have somewhere to live. Some people, for whatever reason, don't want one. And I don't think we should force anyone to do anything unless it's, unless it's demonstrably against their interest. Um, but yeah, of course, it's a big homeless problem uh, for all sorts of reasons, whether it's addiction problems or mental health reasons or, or just poverty or people who are going through a crisis, a family crisis, and they're chucked out of their house. I mean, homelessness can affect anyone. And what bothers me is you see people saying, oh, well, I don't really care about homeless because it's, it's never going to be me. But of course, you could be in a well-paid job and then you could have a divorce or, or something and get chucked out of your house. Then what do you do? Mm. You know, if, if all your money's dried up, then that, people end up homeless who never thought they would be. And then there's that end of the spectrum all the way down to people with proper sort of mental health issues who really should be being looked after. So what do we do? As I say, in a fantasy world, everyone would have a lot more money for the services that these people need. At the moment, that's not true. And you end up with really sad situations like people with mental health issues who end up in police cells because that's literally the only place that, that they have to put them. They're not, they're not criminals. They haven't done anything wrong. But the police cell is the only place where there is a responsible person who can look out for them. And that's not right. You know, when they closed the, uh, the uh, sort of mental hospitals uh, back in the sort of 90s, 80s, 90s, um, they were saying, this is great because now we can care for people in the community. But what they didn't do is put the money into the community. So maybe there's a good case for building um, healthcare centres with just accommodation in for anyone who needs it, anyone who's having a mental health crisis, just so they can stay there until a healthcare professional can come and see them and treat them. So nobody should have to be on the street, especially when it's cold. I mean, it's a bit warmer now, but I remember how cold it was when it was snowing. It's absolutely, you know, we're this, again, the sixth richest country in the world. It, uh, it shames us that anyone is homeless. Of course we could, they don't have to be. Of course we've got the money to house them. I mean, we've got the money to give them houses if we want to. It's just a political decision that we don't really do anything at all for them. So just quickly before we wrap up, what do you think could be one thing that could change to help less people being homeless? Um, I, th I think don't cut funding for the sort of services that people need before they get homeless. Uh, whether that uh, is um, mental health services or uh, the people getting financial assistance with their children or financial, uh, financial assistance with all sorts of issues, work issues. I mean, there's some people who, who are homeless who work, um, you know, which is crazy. That anyone working should be able to afford somewhere to live. Um, these things are reasonably, quite reasonably easy to do. Um, have people, as I say, trained to look out for people who are vulnerable. So anyone who... Um, goes to hospital, there should be people at the hospital who can spot anyone who's at risk um, because a lot of people do tend to use healthcare services before they end up homeless, whether it's a mental health crisis or some other me uh, medical issue. Um, again, these things just cost money. We've, we've just got to be prepared to pay for, this, for the society we want. We can't just say, keep cutting, keep cutting, keep cutting, and just expect everything to work because things are falling over. They're, it's just starting now, but it's going to get worse and worse. Mm. Um, so yeah, it basically, look at budgets for social care and make sure they're increased. And the people who, uh, who know what to do are, are all there, you know. But, you know, Baines is talking about sacking hundreds of workers in the council. Those, those workers all do something. Mm. Some of them will be doing stuff for people who are vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and now we're going to ask the audience if they have any questions for us. So. Oh, right. <laughs> Not to worry then. Uh, thank you very much for joining with us today, Dominic. And thank you all for viewing, and goodbye for now. Thanks. Thank you.